Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great uh, honor to be at the uh, PD Rhythm meeting and congratulations to the organizers on a wonderful event. It's also personal for me to be back in Boston where I had uh, completed my uh, EP training uh, several years ago. Um, I remember at the end having to explain where was this Edmonton in Alberta that was going to and how far north you had to uh, look on the, uh, on the map. Uh, but uh, Edmonton is a, uh, a lovely city, great quality of life. Yes, the rivers uh, do melt in the summer and no, there are no igloos. Uh, it's also close to the uh, Canadian Rockies, a uh, beautiful landscape for amazing uh, hiking and uh, canoeing and uh, great skiing in the winter. Whoops, I'm not sure how this got in here, but yes, we do have beautiful lakes as well. I'm trying to get rid of it. Uh, you may have noticed um, on these pictures, these brown uh, pine trees, um, and uh, there are unfortunately fields of them. And uh, the culprit for this is this uh, mountain pine beetle that attacks the pine needles, kills them, and kills the trees. And it's causing devastating damage to the uh, rock. Is, uh, as you drive along the uh, highway, you see fields and fields of these uh, dead brown um, uh, pine trees. And um, um, obviously this um, pine beetle is not acting alone. This infestation is, is perpetuated by drought and uh, dense forests, lack of wildfires, believe it or not, and other infestations. However, there are still beautiful picturesque uh, green fields that are lovely to visit and uh, also free of any infestation. So what's the scope of the problem? This is a satellite view of the um, Canadian Rockies on the left and the Colorado Rockies on the right. And only the areas in bright red are uh, affected by this uh, pine beetle infestation. So really relatively small uh, problem. So the mountain pine beetle is like VT in adult congenital heart disease. It can be devastating and deadly. It's not acting alone, but overall the burden is low. The title for this talk was an update on risk stratification schemes for VT in congenital heart disease. And I found myself with two main questions. Can I or can we discuss VT without discussing sun cardiac death? And can we discuss VT in congenital heart disease without mostly talking about the charge of follow? Let's answer the first question, uh, the second question uh, first. When talking about VT and sun cardiac death in adult congenital heart disease, we all know that the flagship patient population is the repaired tetralogy of fellow. And the main reason for this has been the fact that this is the most common cyanotic heart disease. And the fact that the sun cardiac death is the most common cause of late mortality among this patient population as shown in the early studies and subsequent studies showing the high burden of arrhythmia in this patient population, um, as well as the high incidence of sun death uh, over time. And even more recent studies with large patient populations, so over 25,000 patients with congenital heart disease um, and looking at sun cardiac death the leading lesion was unfortunately the tetralogy of fellow. And when looking at recipients of ICDs um, in that patient population, again, the leading uh, lesion is repaired to tetralogy of fellow. What's uh, the scope of the problem again? The risk of sudden cardiac death in repaired to tetralogy of fellow is 0.15% per year, and it's 0.09% per year in the uh, adult congenital uh, patient population at large. So again, it's relatively uh, small. And this will be very relevant later. The second question was about VT. So is it VT, only VT? Is it VT and VF? Ultimately, it's the risk of VT and or sudden cardiac death. Um, as you will see, because of the pathophysiology and because most of the studies out there do combine these two as an outcome. So we are forced to look at the two together. And this gives us uh, an opportunity to reflect on this pathophysiology. Uh, as uh, and very nicely shown by the previous speaker, we know that whether it's a RVOT patch or SCAR or a VSD patch, the most common arrhythmia in this patient population is a macro reentrant uh, type of VT. However, the mere presence of a scar or a patch is not sufficient to result in VT. This is a multifactorial uh, problem that involves many other players, including hypertrophy, cyanosis, ischemia, dyssynchrony, this ventricular systolic and diastolic dysfunction, and so on. 
and whether all or a portion of these factors come into play, they eventually lead to progressive myocardial fibrosis, electromechanical modulation, and ultimately transmural regional, um, sorry, and regional uh, dispersion. And this results in the perfect isthmus that will allow this macro reentry to propagate. But this fibrosis also results in areas of uh, micro reentry and more ominous arrhythmias like VT uh, and polymorphic VT, I mean, and uh, VF. So VT and sudden cardiac death are pathophysiologically similar, but they are still different. And this was shown in the early uh, studies um, where predictors of uh, monomorphic VT and sound cardiac death were sought. And although several factors were common to the two, there were definitely significant differences or several differences identified in these early studies. Now let's focus back on the main objective of this talk, which is the risk certification for VT and sudden cardiac death in congenital heart disease. I'll start with this uh, uh, paper that is now uh, about um, 10 years old, but it was a great undertaking uh, um, of uh, three registries with over 25,000 patients. Um, and one of the objectives was looking at sudden death in this patient population, of which 80% were arrhythmic sudden deaths. And it included a broad array of different congenital uh, lesions, including uh, cyanotic Eisenmenger syndrome. And in this study, they identified a few predictors of sun cardiac death. First and foremost was moderate to severe LV and RV dysfunction. They also identified SVT, QRS duration, and QT dispersion. Let's take a closer look at the last two. This is a scatter plot comparing QRS duration between victims of sun cardiac death on the left and controls on the right. On the left-hand side is the QRS duration, and on the right-hand side is QT dispersion. And as you can see, there's significant overlap between the two, and no matter what cutoff you use, yeah, there will be uh, uh, significant overlap. The authors also showed this um, uh, nice association between QRS duration and ventricular dysfunction. Um, or ventricular EF, LV on the top, RV on the bottom. And they showed that lower EF or uh, mild to mo uh, moderate to severe dysfunction is associated with longer QRS uh, duration. So maybe a representative um, of it. A few years later, this data, this data was used in a prospective evaluation of 783 consecutive uh, adult congenital heart disease patients. And the... Um, Composite outcome of interest was sun cardiac death, aborted cardiac arrest, sustained ventricular arrhythmia, and appropriate ICD shocks. And um, they started with a congenital heart disease, heart disease lesion-specific baseline risk that was derived from the Concor registry. And to that, they, they added a risk score with one point each for the variables and the or the factors that I highlighted in the previous uh, review of the study, along with New York Heart Association and coronary artery disease. And when they looked at this risk scoring uh, scheme, they found uh, that it had a sensitivity of 50%, meaning it identified only four of the eight uh, patients who had either sun cardiac death or uh, documented VT or VF, and the specificity of 75%. This is a, another study by the Spanish uh, Adult Congenital Heart Disease um, uh, Network. Um, again, uh, looking at predictors of sudden cardiac death in the adult congenital heart disease patient population. And in this study, they uh, created this risk um, prediction model as shown on the left with all these variables. We won't go through, the, through all the variables, but I will highlight a few. First and foremost in this study, again, was a lesion-specific risk stratification and uh, uh, lesion-specific odds ratio. They divided the lesions into low, moderate, and high risk, and uh, each were uh, assigned a, um, a risk um, uh, a level. Uh, they also identified, um, again, common theme uh, predictors, such as uh, symptoms and ischemic heart disease, as well as um, ventricular systolic uh, dysfunction and uh, dilation. And they were able to validate this model and uh, come up with a five-year uh, risk prediction for sun cardiac death and sun cardiac arrest. Uh, 
and they identified a high-risk group, which was defined as those with a 5% or more yearly risk of a sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac arrest. However, in that group, um, the true positive rate was only 54%. Uh, they also identified an intermediate group uh, for whom they highlighted the importance of additional investigations, such as a cardiac MRI, which we'll review later, and uh, the value of an EP study, which will be discussed uh, this uh, afternoon, later this afternoon. What's nice about the study is that this risk score is available as a calculator online. And here I've um, used it to show an example of a typical tetralogy of a low, 27 year old tetralogy of a low patient. They also provide a nice cheat sheet of the uh, different uh, lesion and their um, uh, lesion specific uh, stratification. So you can enter the right number in the first line of the calculator. Now I'd like to move on to um, uh, two studies looking at specifically the tetralogy of a low patient population. This uh, first study is uh, the indicator registry with over 800 uh, patients and the outcome um, identified in the study were four patients with VT and 32 with deaths of whom only four had sudden cardiac death. The predictors identified in this study uh, were again, LV and RV dysfunction, as well as RV hypertrophy and atrial arrhythmias. And on the right-hand side, the others showed the effect of uh, cumulative risk uh, uh, factors um, resulting in a higher risk of uh, um, uh, being, uh, higher risk of the outcome being either VT or sudden cardiac uh, death. This is a, um, a data from a multicenter retrospective uh, study from the PACES um, uh, group uh, that was in the form of a matched case control study that included 72 cases and 216 controls, again, looking at uh, predictors of ventricular arrhythmia in patients with the tetralogy of fellow. The 72 cases consisted mostly of, pa of patients with sustained ventricular arrhythmia at 57%, and the remaining uh, main group were, were those uh, victims of sudden death or resuscitated cardiac arrest. And from that data, a, a decision tree was created. The first thing that was uh, identified as the uh, uh, important initial step in creating a uh, accurate decision tree was the difference in errors in terms of risk stratification. <clears throat> Subsequent to that, there were two main predictors uh, that uh, led the group, uh, led the risk stratification, and, that, and those were arrhythmic symptoms and ventricular dysfun dysfunction, specifically LV dysfunction, among others. And this tree allowed uh, uh, identification of uh, patients in the low, moderate, and high-risk group. And when looking, when looking at patients in the moderate and high-risk group, the sensitivity of this decision tree was 88% and specificity was 68%. These main variables, among others, were uh, then um, um, uh, modified into this important uh, uh, factor uh, scoring system that was, again, era-specific. And... Um, this scoring system allowed the identification of different risk groups, uh, low, medium, high, and very high risk groups, depending on the total score uh, obtained, uh, again, uh, era specific. And when looking at patients in the high and very high risk group, uh, meaning those with a score of seven or more, the scoring system had a positive predictive value of 57% and a negative predictive value of 85%. So what's the status of risk certification so far? A great knowledge and advancements in risk certification have been made as a community, as you saw from these uh, uh, only a few studies. And presently, there are several risk certification schemes available to us. However, the predictive power of different risk certification models remains suboptimal. And this is related to challenges with this uh, patient population that I would like to review because they are really relevant to our discussion. First is the incidence rate. The low overall rate of VT and sun cardiac death as identified in different studies make this a very difficult uh, task with very low numbers in different studies, even when involving thousands of patients. The other main um, uh, challenge is the stochastic nature of arrhythmic events in this uh, patient uh, population that make 
risk prediction very challenging. As you very well know, this is also a very heterogeneous patient population. And this table shows only one example being the age at repair and how it changed from uh, over uh, four decades from, for example, 9.7 years to 0.7 years. And this is only one of many examples of how heterogeneous this patient population uh, is in terms of anatomy and specifically uh, medical and surgical uh, care over the uh, eras. The other uh, important um, factor to consider is how we assess this patient population. We draw a lot of insight and guidance from uh, the myocardial infarct uh, older patient population in order to um, know how to better risk stratify this patient population and risk predict for outcomes. However, this is a graph showing from the Valiant trial showing the um, a rate of sudden uh, death or cardiac death in an adult patient population starting at 0 0.0 on the left, which is the uh, time of a myocardial infarction. And as you can see, the risk of sudden uh, death or cardiac arrest gradually decreases over time, and this is months, um, and obviously is a risk stratif stratified per EF. In contrast, this is the risk of VT and sudden death and the congenital heart disease patient population and the trial of follow. And it's 20, 30, and even 40 years later, whether it's in the earlier studies or the more recent studies, when the outcome of interest being either VT or VF or, or sudden death um, and becomes um, uh, a, a a dominant uh, a issue. And it's 20, 30, 40 years later that we have uh, to predict uh, the uh, uh, outcome. So there's significant difference. And this uh, leads us to the, to the second issue, which is a time to event um, issue uh, or challenge. And the latency between certain risk factors, meaning the initial surgery and the outcome, which is several decades later, and relates to a... Um, simple statistical uh, principle, which is uh, the fact uh, that there's lower accuracy of a predictor that is remote from the outcome. And I want to spend a little bit of time going through a few examples to highlight the importance of, uh, of this. I'll take a few uh, predictors that have been identified over the years uh, to discuss this. So um, <clears throat> let's start with ventriculotomy as an example. And when trying to look at its association with VT 20 or 30 years later, while well, ventriculotomy is maybe the area around which the VT will propagate. So maybe ventriculotomy will carry its weight as a factor that is related to the outcome um, over time. But what about age at repair, whether age at repair represents different eras or whether it's different age within the same era? I don't think I need to say much to convince you that over time and over decades, the effect of age or of repair or part of it will fade with time and its association with the outcome will weaken with time. Same thing for cyanosis, whether even though that starts early on, its long-term effect on the outcome that several decades later um, uh, will be diluted. Shunt as well. The physiological effect of a shunt that occurred 20, 30 years later um, may not be directly related to the outcome uh, of, uh, of interest. What about assessing the um, heart via an MRI to look at LV and RV, uh, late gadolinium enhancement and fibrosis? Well, this is a more contemporaneous uh, thing, but it may have a closer relationship or correlation with the outcome that we are interested in now, which is a VT or VF um, that uh, is related to this fibrosis. And what about all these other factors, cardiopulmonary bypass, myocardial protection, cures duration, uh, pulmonary regurgitation, RV volume overload, and the different genetics of different individuals and their ability to heal their myocardium. Well, maybe all of these can all coalesce and be represented in a more contemporary assessment that shows us the end product of all these different myocardial insults and the ultimate uh, outcome, which is the risk of VT and sonicardic death that we are interested in. 
So what's the outlook on risk stratification? There continues to be uh, a quest for refinement, uh, which is very encouraging. And technology is on our side, um, as shown by the previous speaker with the value of electroatomical mapping and risk stratification that way, as well as myocardial imaging and better understanding of the myocardial health of ventricles and the risk of uh, uh, arrhythmias. And I wanna finish with this study that I think gives us insight into the, 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 the future um, that is building on this effort of risk stratification. This is a prospective uh, a study of consecutive patients with repaired trilogy of fellow who underwent an MRI. Um, the majority had a ventriculotomy, so obviously an older patient population. And the uh, primary outcome uh, was uh, death. And uh, there were 27 um, uh, deaths, uh, less than half were sudden cardiac deaths. The secondary outcome was uh, ventricular arrhythmias, and there were 21 nine patients, and uh, the majority included uh, 10 sudden cardiac deaths and uh, 16 with sustained VT. And the authors were um, able to uh, create this risk score to predict sudden cardiac death that included, um, as you see in the table on the left, uh, gadolinium enhancement uh, and grades of it for the uh, left, right ventricle, left ventricle, ejection fraction, um, and uh, age, and, uh, and uh, uh, so on. And using this risk scoring system, they were able to identify the high-risk uh, group with a 4.4% uh, annual uh, risk of sun cardiac uh, death and differentiate them for the lower risk group. Using a, a slightly modified but similar scoring system, uh, they were also able to identify the high risk group for uh, the secondary outcome, which is ventricular arrhythmias, with an annual risk of 3.7%. And the 4.4 and 3.7% are important uh, numbers here um, in terms of uh, being able to properly risk stratify patients and make uh, decisions about primary prevention uh, ICD. So in conclusion, risk stratification for congenital heart disease remains a humbling task um, and faces many challenges, um, including the dynamic nature of congenital heart disease uh, management over decades, as uh, we discussed, the delay between the intervention and the outcome, and the low variable and stochastic rates of life-threatening events. Nevertheless, several important variables have been reaffirmed in different studies, and these include arrhythmic symptoms, age or era, lesion uh, or repair complexity, and ventricular health defined by the systolic function, hypertrophy, fibrosis, and so on. And we now have several risk certification schemes at our disposal. However, VT and sudden cardiac death are often blended in these risk prediction uh, schemes. And although um, statistically complicated and sophisticated, you can realize that multivariable models are in a way simplistic. <clears throat> and the heterogeneity between these patient populations calls for more of an individualized rather than a population-based approach to risk stratification. So looking ahead, I think we need to improve on our ability to differentiate between VT that's amenable to ablation versus an overall risk of sun cardiac death and consider looking at this patient population using negative risk uh, predictors rather than positive risk predictors. Uh, we also should consider um, integrating more contemporaneous and dynamic risk stratification parameters, such as fibrotic burden and its progression over time, whether we use serial MRIs or ultrafast ultrasound that looks at transmural dispersion. And partly try to focus at the end product of prior myocardial uh, insults as part of our risk prediction strategy. And finally, um, we should consider uh, adapting more novel and complexity accommodating prediction schemes such as artificial intelligence that can integrate many parameters and may be better suited for this uh, patient population. Thank you very much.